Welcome to our Wednesday Bible study here on November the 16th of 2022. So glad that you're joining us for this Bible study, and we hope that all of our studies together are beneficial to you, helping you understand better the Word of God. Maybe you want to open your Bibles to Matthew 24. It would be a good idea if you would look at the passage of Scripture with us, open it up, and see what we're going to glean from it. Matthew chapter 24 is a misunderstood uh, chapter. The information within it is often misapplied and applied to things that it really doesn't actually deal with. And so we want to examine Matthew 24. One of the sure ways to correct misunderstanding is to actually read the text for ourselves and look at it. And so today we want to begin a discussion of Matthew 24. We may not get all the way through it this week, but we will get through it, if, if not this week, by next week. So Matthew 24 is our uh, text for our uh, study this week. While you're turning there, let me also invite you to our in-person Wednesday Bible study every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, and also our in-person worship uh, services on Sunday. We, we come together for a Bible study at 10 a.m., for worship service at 11, and then again on Sunday evenings at 6 p.m., we, we reconvene for another period of worship where we can extol the majesty of God, sing praises to him, take our petitions unto him in prayer. And of course, being the Lord's day, each Sunday we partake of the Lord's supper, we give of our means, and we do study God's word together. So we would love to have you come and be with us and worship God with us. Now, as we open up to Matthew 24, like I said, there's a lot of misunderstanding about the content of this chapter. And a lot of it has to do with just simple not observing what is actually there, taking certain parts of it and lifting it out of its overall context. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to be guilty of removing a text from its context because then it becomes a pretext. Maybe you've heard that uh, statement before, but anytime we lift a text out, we can actually twist it and make it say something that it really didn't say, and that's dishonest. We don't want to be among those who handle the Word of God deceitfully, as Paul talked about to the Corinthian brethren. So we want to open up Matthew 24. We want to thoroughly understand Matthew 24, and I understand we may not answer every question that you may have about the text, but we want to give you a a baseline. We want to give you a base understanding of what the content of Matthew 24 is really presenting. So let's open up and begin our discussion. Now, I, this particular study I thought was, was going to be uh, aided by some visual aid, just to kind of direct our minds through some preliminary matters. I want you to understand Matthew 24 as we approach Matthew 24, we simply entitle the chapter a sign. And I think you'll understand what we mean by that as we get down uh, in our discussion as to how Matthew 24 presents a sign particular. And so let's, let's look at these preliminary elements. Number one, in understanding Matthew 24, if we're going to get down to the true interpretation of the words of Jesus. And remember, Jesus is the one who communicated the words of Matthew 24. So it is Jesus who actually determines the interpretation of these words. And it's for you and I to apply the principles of interpretation and correctly comprehend what it was Jesus was aiming to communicate. Not what we want it to say, not what we hope it says, not what some uh, popular preacher says, but what did Jesus actually say? So one of the first things we have to understand is the continuous nature of discourse. Chapter 24 is not an element to itself. The events of chapter 23 lead into Matthew 24. And so you have to look at Matthew 24 in light of what was said in Matthew 23 and then you also have to look at it in light of what was said in Matthew 25 as well, because Matthew 25 actually begins with the word, then. Then shall the kingdom of heaven, which beckons the question, when will the kingdom of heaven be like what he is about to describe? So Matthew 24 is a part of continuous 
discourse. Jesus began the discussion in Matthew 23. Really, the events go back to chapter 21 as he entered Jerusalem, and there is this discourse that he has with his disciples, and in particular as well with the Pharisees who were trying to entrap him in his words. And so chapter 23 plays a significant role in understanding Matthew 24. So let's look at the things in chapter 23 for just a moment that we need to remember as we embark on Matthew 24. Remember the eight occasions where Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, ye hypocrites. So eight times Jesus says there is condemnation that is coming to those scribes, Pharisees, who were hypocrites. And we, we last week talked about who the scribes were and who the Pharisees were and what they were doing as Jesus condemned them. And so in light of that condemnation, notice what he says in verse 36 of chapter 23. He says, Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. <coughs> Excuse me. The these things of verse 36 is a reference back to those woes. That condemnation that he is pronouncing upon them for all of these various hypocrisies, all of these various sins, is going to come upon that generation. That is so important to understand that that pronouncement was on that generation. Notice in chapter 24 in verse number 34, he says, Verily I say unto you, this generation. See, we're still talking about this generation into chapter 24. He said in chapter 23, verse 36, These things shall come upon this generation. In chapter 24 and verse 34, This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So that's a very important thing to remember. You understand the continuous nature of discourse. He was talking to the scribes and Pharisees, the leaders religiously of those Jewish people. And he talks about what they have done and how it's deserving of condemnation. And then he says those things pertaining to that condemnation were going to come upon them. And one of the last things he talked about was the, the blood of the righteous prophets how it had been shed, including Zechariah being slain between the altar and the temple. And so the punishment, the retribution, the uh, judgment against them because of those things was going to fall upon that generation. And then another point from chapter 23 to be remembered, he said, Behold, in verse number 38 of chapter 23, your house is left unto you desolate. Now, he's saying all of these things, in the temple. He is right there within the 19 acres of the temple compound in the first century of what we sometimes would refer to as Herod's temple because it was uh, additionally uh, added on to or it was upgraded by Herod. It was the actually the second temple of the Jews built by Zerubbabel and then upgraded and added to by Herod. And so that temple compound covered about 19 acres, and Jesus is in part of that, that temple area in pronouncing these things. And he says, your house, which would be a reference to the temple. No longer is he referring to it as his father's house, as he did early in his ministry in John chapter 2, but now he refers to it as their house, and it's left unto them desolate or vacant as though God has left the premises. And so the condemnation, it would fall upon that generation, and their house is left unto them desolate. It's very important to keep those things in mind if you're going to correctly interpret the, the content of Matthew 24. Number two in this preliminary data, you've got to note the questions of the disciples. Now, three things that you got to uh, look at here. Number one, what, what is it that generated the questions? Number two, it's going to regard the toppling of the temple, which is significant. And then the actual three questions that they, they, they pose. Now, what, what generates the questions? Because whatever is said in Matthew 24 is actually going to be an answer to those disciples with their question. 
So remember in chapter 23, he talked about the house, the temple being left unto them desolate. And in that, after he said those things, verse 1 of 24 says, Jesus went out and departed from the temple. So they're leaving the temple compound. And the disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. So at the outset of these questions that the disciples are going to ask, they are observing the great the great nature of this temple. Now, in Luke's account of this, where Luke regards this, this temple and, and the questions posed toward it, as you come to Luke chapter 21 in verse number uh, 5, and some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts. So back here in Matthew 24, when they're showing him the buildings of the temple, what they are showing or what they're pointing out to Jesus, when he says the house is left unto them desolate, they're pointing out the fact that this house is made of goodly stones and there are abundance of gifts. So what do those, you know, just kind of put it in perspective, what do we mean by goodly stones? Well, some of the stones of the temple, according to Josephus, were as large as 60 foot long and 15 foot tall. Now, we here at Union Hill have a fellowship hall, what we call a fellowship hall. It's a part of our building that's actually detached from the uh, structure proper, the, the church building proper. And that particular structure, we do conduct Wednesday night Bible class in. Uh, we, we sometimes partake of meals in there together and so forth. But that structure is actually smaller than one of these stones. I think it's about a 50 by 30 or a 50 by 40 at the largest. And maybe at its peak, you're talking 15 to 20 feet. Probably not even that. Probably 15 to 16 feet at its peak. So one stone in that temple of, of some of the stones that were there was actually bigger than that structure. And if, you, if you're if you familiar with Union Hill, you know what that building is, and you can, in your mind, kind of think about that structure and how large the stone would be that that building could actually be set inside a stone that large or that that stone would be larger than that building. So we're talking tremendous. When we say goodly stones, we're talking about tremendous stones, and, and several of them made out of marble or, or marble stone. Now, as far as the gifts, they're talking about the gifts of the temple like a golden vine from Herod, according to Tacitus. Uh, he called it a very uh, a temple of vast wealth, we might say. There were crowns, there were shields, there were vessels of gold and silver that were presented by princes and others who visited the temple. So there. There's a great wealth within the temple and then the great stones. And so the, the disciples are observing this. After Jesus said, your house is left unto you desolate, they're trying to put these pieces together. And then Jesus says in verse 2, there shall not be left one stone upon another. Well, think about how large those stones are. When you're dealing with a stone that is 60 foot long and 15 foot tall, you're talking about something catastrophic, it would seem, that would so move those stones that they wouldn't be left one on top of another. They would be disjointed. They would be disconnected. They would be scattered. That's a tremendous impact on that, that structure. So when Jesus says that not one stone will be left upon another, they shall be thrown down, the disciples then ask three questions. So what generated the questions? Jesus may have spurred it when he talked about that house being left desolate. And then the disciples started noting the great vastness of the wealth and the, the uh, solid nature of the structure. And then Jesus retorts, it's not going to remain standing, not even one stone upon another. So their questions are this, which are really three in verse number three. Tell us, when shall these things be? So the first question is the timing. When is this event going to happen that is going to 
decimate this temple? Number two, what shall the sign be of thy coming? Or what shall be the sign of thy coming? So when is it going to happen? What sign is there going to be to indicate that it's about to happen or that it is happening? And then number three, the end of the world. Now, in the mind of the disciples, this this is actually uh, two questions. Or maybe we could look at it as one large question. Uh, when is it going to happen? What's the sign? And when is the end of the world? Because to them, the end of the world and the destruction of that temple must be simultaneous. The cataclysmic event in their minds that would cause the toppling of the temple must be the end of the world, the end of, of life as known on planet Earth. And, and so in their mind, that question of when is the end of the world is no different than when is this temple going to be destroyed and how will we know it's about to happen? So Jesus is going to answer them according to verse 4. Chapter 24 is going to regard those three questions. And we've got to identify how Jesus answers them. What does he say in regard to the answer? Does he treat them as one question or does he treat them as two questions? And we'll have to answer that. Number three. I want you to note the conjunction in verse number 36. He says in verse 36, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now that's a key word right there. In, in understanding and interpreting this, not only do we have to understand it's a continuous discourse that actually started uh, before chapter 23, but certainly with the words of chapter 23, and then the discussion of the temple. But here, this, this particular word is vitally important to correct understanding of the whole chapter. The word but is a coordinating conjunction which joins two words, two ideas, two thoughts of equal value or of um, you know, equal words, equal phrases, equal ideas joined together by that word. But there is a contrast that is, is made by this word. Now, in the Greek, that word day, the, the delta epsilon uh, word, uh, D-E if you're transliterating into the English uh, phonetics, you, you have this, can, this conjunction can be translated and, it can be also, it can be more over. But the context is actually going to determine which of those is correctly translating that word. So recognize that earlier in the chapter, Jesus talked about a sign. In verse 15, he says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him that is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and them that give suck in those days. And pray that your flight be not in the winter. So in, in the early parts of the chapter, he actually indicates a signal, a sign that would actually indicate the event transpiring. But then here in verse number 36, he says, but of that day and hour knoweth no man. It doesn't make sense that on one hand, Jesus would say, here's a sign, but on the other say, there will not be a sign. So clearly we have a distinction being made between two events here, between two things happening. Remember the disciples had thought the destruction of this temple or i.e. the destruction of Jerusalem is got to be the same as the ending of the world. But Jesus says not so fast. Concerning the one, he says, here is the sign. Here is the indicator. But concerning another, he says, there is no sign. Uh, of that day and hour knoweth no man. But as in the days of Noah, so also shall be the coming of the Son, uh, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So, no indication, a warning given, but no sign as to uh, the moment that it's going to transpire or leading up to that moment. 
So the word but is very important here because Jesus divides the discussion. He divides the answer into two parts. Regarding one aspect, he says there is a sign. Regarding another aspect of their question, he says there is no sign. Thus, there are two things or two events under consideration. In the first part, he does say fleeing Judea, which would bring us to understand he's talking about Jerusalem and the temple because it was in that area of Judea. And then as far as the coming of the Son of Man, we're going to understand, even in verse 42, watch therefore, for you know not the hour your Lord doth come. There will be no way to discern that Jesus is about to come. He's there talking about the end of the world. So we can clearly identify that part of this chapter is going to deal with the destruction of Jerusalem, and part of it is going to deal with his second coming or his final coming. Now, one other thing before we really get into a discussion of, of the text itself that we want to understand is this phrase, coming of the Son of Man. Because that phrase is a reference to Jesus. The coming of the Son of Man is a reference to Jesus in some form or fashion. But recognize in the scripture, it's not always a reference to his second or final coming. It's not always a reference to him coming in, in the clouds of heaven, in judgment, uh, final, with a finality uh, as we are awaiting. So, let, let's be clear and, and give some illustration here that there are times, at least five other ways that that phrase is used. So in Matthew chapter 16, there is the occasion, well, first of all, let's mention his first coming. Throughout the Old Testament, there was a an understood uh, fact that Jesus is coming. In fact, that was the message of the Old Testament. Beginning with Genesis 3.15, when it talked about the seed of woman, when it talked about with Abraham in Genesis 12, regarding his seed and how that would bless all nations. And throughout the Old Testament, that picture gets a little clearer and a little clearer until finally in Matthew 1 and Matthew 2, we have the Messiah coming. And so now all of those prophecies are fulfilled. He's here. So in the scriptures, there is a reference to the coming of the Son of Man that references his first coming, that coming in human flesh. The fact that he came into this world as a human being to live among men. So we understand that. But then there's also a note of his coming in his kingdom. In Matthew 16 and verse 28, now remember in that same text, he had talked about building his church and giving unto the key, the under Peter and the other apostles, the keys of the kingdom. And so now he says in verse 28, Verily I say unto you, there be some of you standing here, the very audience that he was then talking to, of those standing there that would not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So there's a reference to the coming of the Son of Man, but it would be a coming of the Son of Man in the lifetime of, of those particular individuals. Well, that fulfillment came in Acts chapter 2. They saw the establishment of the church, and in that way, Jesus came, or the Son of Man came, in his kingdom. And, and some of those very people that stood alive listening to Jesus in Matthew 16 are the very ones who observed and who saw him come in his kingdom, in the form of his kingdom. There's also, in the book of Revelation, a presentation of the idea of, of his coming in the human experience, that is, events within the, the experience of humanity or experiences of humanity. In, in Revelation chapter 2, in verse number 16, uh, he says, repent. Now, he, he's talking to the uh, church at Pergamos, and he says, repent, or else I will come against thee quickly, or come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So there was a coming against the church at Pergamos if they wouldn't repent, a, a coming in time in the fashion of, of fighting against them or working against them with the sword of his mouth. In chapter 3, he says to the church at Laodicea, 
Remember, they were a lukewarm congregation, and Jesus urges them to repent. In verse 20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him, and he will sup and will sup with him, and he with me. If the church at, at Laodicea would repent, then Jesus would, in human in the human experience, have fellowship with them, or would be present with them. And he uses that idea of coming in unto them. So there is the coming of the Son of Man used in the sense of his interaction in the human experience, not in a miraculous way, not in a, a uh, mystical way, but in his providential way, interacting in the affairs of, of humanity. Remember, the, the God of heaven rules in the kingdoms of men, and so he can also affect or impact providentially the lives of individuals too. There is in, in the scriptures a reference to his final coming. So the Son of Man coming in judgment, like in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 16, when he would bring those that had already died righteously with him, and then those that are alive and remain that were faithful to the Lord be caught up together in the air with him, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So that final coming. But then in our text of Matthew 24, You'll, you'll note that in verse number 30, there is the coming of the Son of Man. And in this case, it regards the destruction of Jerusalem. And so there's different ways in which the coming of the Son of Man is used in Scripture. And it is our, our responsibility to identify in context what is meant by the coming of the Son of Man. And in this case, it is a reference to the destruction of Jerusalem. And I think our our viewpoint of chapter 24 will bear this out in our understanding of, of these things. So with those preliminary elements understood, we're dealing with a continuous nature of discourse, so we have to consider what was already said in chapter 23 into our understanding of chapter 24. We have to understand what was said in chapter 25 with our understanding of what is said at the end of chapter 24. We have to note the questions of the disciples and why they were asked and what they were involving. We have to notice in the answer of Jesus the certain markers, in this case, the key word, but, that coordinating conjunction in what it does in this particular passage to identify two distinct subjects or two distinct ideas that have an equality in their value and, and yet distinct or different, that hour of the coming of the Son of Man at the end of the world is distinct from the coming of the Son of Man in the destruction of Jerusalem. And that's clear within this chapter if we read and analyze the entire chapter. So now let's ask this question. How does the chapter break down then? Well, that key word but that begins verse 36 actually divides the chapter. Verse 4 through 35, in answer to the disciples' questions in verse 3, is going to regard the coming destruction of Jerusalem. And so whatever you read there, what, what you read in verse number 4 through verse number 35, you have to apply to the destruction of Jerusalem. You cannot apply it to the end of the world discussion because that's not what is under consideration. So whatever is said from verse 4 to verse 35, you have to note that that is a reference to the destruction of Jerusalem. From verse 36 to verse 51, we are talking about the end of the world. We're talking about the second coming of Jesus. And so whatever is said there regards the coming of Jesus at the end of the world and not the destruction of Jerusalem. So we have that clearly uh, drawn. That line of demarcation between the subjects is very clear when we analyze, even grammatically analyze, chapter 24, understanding the continuous nature of the discourse. Very well understood. Now, having those things recognized, let's go into chapter 24 and think about what Jesus is presenting to them. Remember, he is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and, and what is going to be said, beginning at verse 4, is an answer to that second question that the disciples had asked. His apostles asked him, when shall these things be, but 
Secondly, what is the sign of these things? So what we're going to look at from verse number four through verse number 22, really, is, or even further, is an answer to that, what is the sign? And Jesus will begin from verse four to verse 14 and answer what isn't a sign. And then he'll say, here's the true sign. And then in verse 16 through 22, he's going to identify what to do when you see the sign. How do you uh, properly respond to that sign? Now, one final question we're actually going to have to understand here, and, and this may be where we draw an end to it today, is what is the significance of this destruction of Jerusalem to the overall purpose of Matthew? And, and when we open it up, talking about Matthew 24, and we will assign this chapter the title, A Sign, that's where the emphasis is going to lie. Why did Jesus relay this information? What about this information actually uh, goes to the purpose of Matthew identifying Jesus as the Messiah? So let's think, first of all, from verse number 4 to verse number 14, false signs. Don't be deceived. There's going to be things that, that occur. And you're going to look at these things and wonder if these are signs. And, and Jesus says they're not. These are not going to be indicators that the destruction of Jerusalem is about to transpire. But keep in mind these things that he mentions are actually a reference to the destruction of Jerusalem mm -hmm. or regarding the destruction of Jerusalem. Because some of these things people put as signs of the end times and they don't even realize that in chapter 24, Jesus is saying these are not signs. I believe it was Billy Graham who years ago did a, a, a complete um, video or sermon probably on national TV about Matthew 24 and something like 10 signs of, of the end times. Well, that would be a misapplication because Jesus says these aren't even signs at all of the destruction of Jerusalem, much less the end of time. Notice he says, take heed that no man deceive you. That, that wording right there in verse number four indicates that these are, are things that may be pointed to as signs that aren't. And if you fall for it, you're deceived. For many shall come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and many shall deceive or deceive many. In fact, Josephus and Tacticus uh, relate that Prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, there were many people who claimed to be the Christ. There were many imposters. He said, ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. A lot of times people look at, at the time, and, and in my lifetime, I haven't lived through uh, major conflicts in our nation's history like World War I or World War II. My grandfather was a veteran of World War II, and, and others that I know had been, I know of others who were uh, veterans of the Korean War. I know those who were veterans of the Vietnam War. All of those were really before my time on earth, at least time of recognition in my lifespan. Uh, we've had interlockings with uh, Iran. Uh, we've had interlockings with Iraq. We've had Bosnia. We've had um, interaction with, with uh, other circumstances, even currently in, in the circumstance in Ukraine, Russia war, and so forth, there, there are wars and rumors of wars all the time. Even currently, you'll hear a lot of talk in the national news about events regarding China or North Korea or Russia involving the U.S. and, and all of these wars and rumors of wars. And people look at that and say, see there, there's a sign that the end times are coming. Jesus said, don't be deceived. That's not a sign. It's not a sign of the end times because that's not even what he's talking about. And it's not a sign of the destruction of Jerusalem. So don't misapply it. He said, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. See, that's not a sign. Nation shall rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. A lot of those things happen. In fact, among those things, there was one such famine in Rome in AD 65. Now that's five years uh, before the destruction of Jerusalem, because the destruction of Jerusalem occurred in AD 70, which was actually about uh, 30, 
uh, maybe 27 years, depending on the calendar that you use. Uh, most of the time we relate the, the life of Jesus beginning at, at year zero. And so if he died at 33, we're in 33 AD when he says these things. Others mark it at, at year four uh, BC. And so you'd be in year 30 AD when Jesus said these things. Either way, you're some 30 to 27 to 30 years away from the destruction of Jerusalem when he says these. But five years before, there was a famine in Rome that actually killed 30,000 people in, in Rome, just in the city of Rome. And so there was those things of pestilence and famine and earthquakes. All of those things often correspond to wars. Those are commonalities when, when there is major conflicts, major wars that, that are undertaken. And so he says, these are the beginning of sorrow. That, that's not the sign of the destruction of Jerusalem, but, but that is a beginning point where sorrows may occur. He says, Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake, talking about uh, Christians and even Jews. Remember, uh, Nero used the Jews as a scapegoat for the burning of Jerusalem, and they, they were hated, but more importantly, Christians were hated. Uh, I should say Nero used the Christians. And so Jesus said they would be hated. Those were things that would happen. There would be false prophets. Uh, iniquity shall abound, and the love of many shall wax cold. Uh, sin is going to be rampant. The love that many have for their fellow man, that they have for their families, that they have for the Lord, was going to, to wane. It was going to wax cold, and, and the, that love wouldn't be there. But he says, he that shall endure in the end, the same shall be saved. You endure this. In Luke, he said, possess ye your souls. In your patience, possess ye your souls or preserve your souls. Those that would endure, those that would persevere, those that would, would withstand the temptation and the onslaught of affliction would ultimately be saved. Then notice what he says in verse 14. This gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of Jesus Christ shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come before the destruction of Jerusalem would, would come about. The end that he's talking about is the end of the Jewish economy that ultimately came with the, the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple. In such, all of those uh, genealogies were lost. They could not reestablish the priesthood or the kingship because all of those family ties could not be proven. Think about what happened in the days of Nehemiah with those that could not prove their ancestry. They weren't allowed to serve. They, they had to be able to prove it. In the destruction of Jerusalem, that wouldn't, that wouldn't uh, be able to happen any longer. And so the end would come. That destruction of Jerusalem, that toppling of the temple would come, but not until the gospel had been preached to the whole world. When Paul wrote the book of Colossians in the early 60s A.D., he said the gospel had been preached under, un, under the whole uh, sun, every creature under heaven. And so the gospel within that first 30 years, from the time of Pentecost until uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, the whole world had access to the gospel. Now, all of those things from verse 4 to verse number 12 were not signs of the end. In fact, they would come about during a time when the gospel would be preached to the whole world. The gospel of the kingdom would be preached in the whole world for a witness unto all nations. Now we come to verse 15, and we actually have the true sign. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. The, the sign of Daniel, or what Daniel spoke of, the abomination of desolation would be the sign that would indicate the time was coming. Now in Luke's account, in, in Luke um, chapter 21 and verse 20, he said, when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. When the Roman army came down to Jerusalem, and stood outside the walls of the city, then they needed to understand the desolation was about to occur. When the Roman army had breached Jerusalem and went into the temple and despoiled it, and they set up their own 
uh, sacrifices. Abomination is an Old Testament word used to describe idolatry. And even in Daniel chapter 9, when he gave forth the 70 weeks prophecy, that's what he's talking about here in verse 15. We don't have time to go back and discuss all that Daniel talked about with the 70 weeks. Uh, that's for a later discussion dealing with the book of Daniel. But he's saying what Daniel spoke about in that time period, in the breakdown of that 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the Roman army actually entered into Jerusalem and they offered sacrifices to their gods in that city, in that temple, prior to its destruction. That was the abomination of desolation. Now, when you see that, they hadn't yet destroyed it. When you see that happen, when those armies have encompassed them, enter into the city and enter into the temple compound and begin to offer their sacrifices, that's the abomination of desolation. You see that? How do you respond? Verse 16, if you're in Judea, flee into the mountains. Get out. Get far away from Jerusalem. Let him that is in the housetop not come down and take anything out of his house. If you're in the rooftop, which was a common place to, to lounge. They didn't have air conditioners. And so a lot of times sitting in the house top on the roof of the house, a flat uh, thatch roof or mud roof uh, would be a place to, to uh, escape the heat within. And, and he says, if you're there, you come down by the outside uh, means. You don't go back into the house to gather up things. You get out as quick as possible. Um, if you're in the field, out, generally the fields will be outside the city wall. Don't go back into the city, into the house to gather your things and go. You leave from the field and you escape. And woe to them that are with child and them that give suck in those days because it will be harder to flee. If you, if you have a, an infant child, it's going to be harder to evacuate or harder to leave because of, of that circumstance. Uh, if it's in the wintertime, that's going to be difficult because of the weather, because of the harsher conditions. If it's on the Sabbath day, the gates of the city are normally closed, making it difficult. So pray that it's not in the winter. Pray that it's not on the Sabbath day. For then, when that sign is seen, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days... Notice in verse 22, he twice repeats those days, except those days be shortened. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Down in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Notice that, that those days are important. He's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. And so he tells them how to respond. Now, someone might ask, well, what about these uh, things And in verse number 20? Uh, Verse number 29, he says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Well, those languages about the sun being darkened and so forth, that's not language that is unfamiliar to the, the Bible to the scriptures. That's actually language that has been used before. It's symbolic language. If you go back to Isaiah chapter 13, you'll notice that that was language relative to the fall of Babylon. In uh, chapter 34, verse 3 and 5, it was uh, words of Idumea. In Ezekiel 32, 78, it was words about Egypt. And so that was symbolic or ap apocalyptic language uh, that was used to describe the rise and fall of nations, or particularly the fall of nations, nations losing their dominion, uh, their leadership crumbling, or their leadership being destroyed and giving way to others. And so in this case, with the destruction of Jerusalem, we have the downfall of, of the Jewish economy, the Jewish leadership, particularly scribes and Pharisees, uh, of, of chapter 23, woe unto them. And so the destruction of Jerusalem is, is the topic of verse 4 uh, through verse number 35. And Jesus says, 
in verse number 32, learn the parable of the fig tree. Interesting that this is just uh, a day after the the fig tree was notable uh, uh, of having withered. Remember how on, on his coming into Jerusalem, he curses it. The next day they see it withered up. It gave false sign. And now he talks about a fig tree that gives forth proper sign. And he says, when the branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that the summer is nigh. So when you begin to see that fig tree bloom out or to leaf out, starting to become green in its um, uh, youngest, uh, tenderest shoots, you know that it's almost summertime. It's a sure sign that summer is right around the corner. Just think about the spring of the year when things start springing out and, and at what point you begin to see blooms on the trees and so forth. You know that, that we're advancing into a new time of the year and, and winter is passing. So he says, pay attention to the sign. We understand that because of that warning of Jesus, there was not one Christian who died in, in that destruction of Jerusalem because they listened to, they heeded the warning, they paid attention as it were to the fig tree. And Jesus says, that um, in verse number 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. They weren't going to be void. When Jesus spoke of the destruction of Jerusalem, he says, it will happen. And in AD 70, it did, just as Jesus had said that it would. And so there is significant writing that, that Matthew does here pertaining to the destruction of Jerusalem. I hope you can clearly understand now that in verse 4 through verse number 35, that is the discussion. He's not referencing the end of the world. Uh, there, there is no uh, signs relative to wars and rumors of wars and, and the actual sun being darkened as in an eclipse or things like that that is going to signal the end of the world. In fact, in the next part of chapter 24, which we won't have time to get to today, he actually says there is no sign. So there is no indicator. There is nothing you can look at and say, oh, the end is near or, or Jesus is about to come. There is nothing like that. But for the destruction of Jerusalem, there was. And you have to look at verse four through verse number 35 as it pertains to the destruction of Jerusalem. To apply it to something else would be to mishandle the scripture and would actually be dishonest. And anyone who does that is not honestly handling the scriptures. I'm not necessarily saying they're outright uh, lying and deceiving you. They may just not have the proper understanding of it, but they need to investigate it a little further. There are some who knowingly are deceiving you because they know better than, than to teach other than what Jesus spoke here. Destruction of Jerusalem. Now, the final thought for today's uh, discussion is simply this. What do these things have to do with what Jesus is being presented as by Matthew? Remember, Matthew is presenting Jesus as the Messiah, as the King of Kings and, and the Lord of Lords. In verse number 30, Jesus said this, Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He is saying this destruction of Jerusalem is ultimately a sign of the Messiahship of Jesus. In fact, it is a sign that is surely showing, declaring that Jesus is enthroned in heaven. That idea of the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven is a similar phrase used in Isaiah chapter 19 and verse 1, dis uh, discussing God triumphing over Egypt, riding upon the clouds. What that is, is a demonstration of authority, of dominion, of power. And so he's saying this destruction of Jerusalem, when you see that, you are seeing the Son of Man coming in his glory and power. Mm -hmm. What we have here is, is ultimately a sign that the Messiah is enthroned. The king is sitting on his throne. And that's what Peter said occurred in Acts chapter uh, 2 and verse 36. So what do we take away from the fact that, number one, Jesus prophesied about the destruction of Jerusalem. He was a true prophet. 
So being a true prophet and that which he spoke came to pass, we need to hearken unto every word he spoke. And another reason we need to hearken unto every word he spoke is because that very destruction of Jerusalem that he prophesied about that came to pass signaled him as being enthroned. It was a clear message that Jesus is at the right hand of God on his throne reigning over men within his kingdom. You a part of that kingdom? Understand, Jesus is a king, but he's a king over his kingdom. And the way to get the benefits from the king, the benefits of citizenship, is to be a part of his kingdom. And so mark it down. Be understanding of this one point. Jesus is on his throne now. It's not something that's going to come at a latter day. It's not something that's going to, to come in, in, in a time period after a, a, a period of rapture. And that's not what is talked about here. That's not even biblical. But right now, Jesus is enthroned upon his throne in heaven at the right hand of God. He is king over his kingdom. And the destruction of Jerusalem was a clear sign and an indication that he is solidified upon that throne. Are you beckoning unto the king of glory? Are you following the king of glory? Are you obedient and submissive? to the king of glory as he sits enthroned on the right hand of God. Hopefully you understand a little better about Matthew 24, or you have your understanding of Matthew 24 uh, more, more thoroughly entrenched within your mind as to know what Jesus was speaking of. Next week, we'll come back and talk about that last question the disciples ask, what about the end of the world? And we'll glean what Jesus has to say and even embark into chapter 25 as he gives some explanation to those points that he makes at the end of chapter 24. God bless you till next week.